Well, as we've just heard, uh, today Jesus meets the Samaritan woman by Jacob's well, and uh, we can read this gospel from year A because uh, it speaks so strongly to what we will be celebrating in this cathedral and, uh, uh, and in many uh, other places throughout the world at the Easter Vigil, namely um, the, uh, the, the new birth of new members of the church who will be baptized and anointed with the Holy Spirit and receive their first Holy Communion. Next Sunday we will hear the Gospel also from John, but from John chapter 9 of the healing of the man born blind, and the Sunday after, the fifth Sunday of Lent, the Gospel of the raising of Lazarus. All of these are to help us uh, enter into the mystery of grace, the mystery of our salvation in Christ. Well, St. Augustine uh, captures the, a lot of the beauty and the energy of this story. Uh, a woman came, he says, she is a symbol of the church, not yet justified, but about to be justified. Justification follows from the conversation. She came in ignorance, she found Christ, and he enters into conversation with her. Let us see what it is about. Let us see why a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Uh, let us see what it is about. Uh, let's all try and see what this great gospel is about. The Samaritans, who still exist uh, today, very few in number, uh, uh, some in Tel Aviv and some in, in Nablus, were for the Jews uh, heretics. They believed in the same God. They accepted the law of Moses, but they would have nothing to do with the temple in Jerusalem. They had their own temple uh, on their own mountain in Samaria, Mount Gerizim. Perhaps we could say relations between the Jews and the Samaritans at the time of Christ were not unlike those between the Israelis and the Palestinians now, and there were often uh, hostile incidents between them. So this is an extraordinary meeting that between a Jew, Jesus, and between this Samaritan woman. You are a Jew, says the woman. She's surprised. And you ask me, a Samaritan, for a drink. So let us see what it is about. I think it's good to focus on this woman. It's as if the gospel gives us a five-minute sort of video clip about her. Uh, we could even call her Samantha, if you like. Samantha, just to make it a bit more alive, Samantha the Samaritan, Sammy to her friends. Uh, we feel we know her. She's quite feisty. She's argumentative. Uh, there's a lot of psychology there when Jesus brings up the delicate question of her five husbands and current man, she immediately changes the uh, the, the, the topic of conversation, and she has had, shall we say, an interesting love life. Five ex-husbands and now another man. You know, you, 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 you could have a feature about her in Hello! magazine, possibly. You know, she's that kind of person. And she's intrigued by this Jew beside the well. And we can say something happens to Samantha through this conversation. She's not the same person at the end of this meeting. Jesus is actually, if we think about it, man number seven uh, in her life, though on a different plane. So what has happened to her? Let us see what it is about. Well, looking forward to Easter, I think we can say this, that Jesus, in the course of this meeting, resurrects her. Uh, he has not yet risen himself, but he is already the resurrection and the life, and his humanity 
is already the instrument of his life-giving divinity. And this woman experiences what Catholic tradition calls the first resurrection, the second resurrection at the end of, of time when we rise from physical death. But the first resurrection is faith. She comes to faith. She is, as St. Paul puts it in the second reading, judged righteous and at peace with God, justified, as Paul says. She enters, or at least she's, uh, she's on the brink of it, into the state of grace, of friendship with God. What a telling little detail. Often in the Gospel of John, there are very uh, telling little details which you can easily miss. But at the end of the conversation, when she goes back to the town, she leaves the water jar behind. That's why she came to the well, to fill her jar with water. But she's been lifted now to a quite different level. Her horizons have been expanded, her life enriched. She's now heard of the living water that this strange man c can give her, this, which, this water which will be a spring welling up within her to eternal life. She has learned about worship of the Father in spirit and in truth. So it's not about Jer Jerusalem and the temple there. It's not about the Samaritan temple on Mount Gerizim. It's no longer tied to a place. Jesus has been her catechist through this meeting. She has had her whole chaotic life revealed to her. She has experienced the scrutinies, really. That's what Jesus says we have today. She is known, and he speaks to the woman, says St. Augustine, and gradually enters into her heart. He is already teaching her. First of all, she calls him a Jew. Then she thinks, ah, oh, possibly he's a prophet, this man. And then at the end, ah, is he the Christ? Today's preface in the Mass says that our Lord created the gift of faith in her and kindled the fire of divine love in her so she can leave her water jar. She's got other preoccupations now. She's thirsty for more than ordinary water. There's something and someone new in her life. She even becomes a missionary telling her fellow townsfolk, here's this guy who has told me my whole life story. Perhaps he is the Christ. She goes home, I mean, to put it in, you know, the silly modern terms, but she goes and puts her uh, encounter on Facebook, you know, and sends it to her 200 friends and, and says, you know, why don't you, and so they, why don't you come and meet this guy? So they all pour out of the town and go and meet Jesus and they come to faith in him. So, you know, what is happening, as St. Augustine says, well, we can say that Jesus has resurrected her. Now, we are en route to Easter, to the celebration of our Lord's resurrection. And at the Easter vigil, our catechumens will receive the living water, springing up to eternal life in the sacraments of baptism and confirmation. They will receive the body and blood of the risen Christ. And there'll be others who will enter into full communion with the church, which is also the body of the risen Christ. And all of us have the opportunity to renew and deepen our faith. So we can say Christ will be rising everywhere. He will Easter in us, as the poet Hopkins says. He is rising everywhere all the time, Jesus. If only we had the eyes to see it, but we can have the faith to see it. Every time we turn from anger to patience, every time we show care for one another, 
whenever we push away the negativity, every time we go to confession, every time we receive the body of Christ, he rises in us. Christ was born, he lived, he died, all so that he could rise in himself and rise in us because without the resurrection, we're still in the soup. Nothing has changed. But if he has risen from the dead, everything is different. Now, this needn't mean we all feel risen all the time, because it's far realer and deeper than that. It means that there is a living water within us, which turns us again and again towards the ocean of God's love. There's faith and hope to draw on. There's the possibility of prayer, lifting up our hearts and minds to God. There's a belonging to the whole body of Christ, which carries us and sustains us like a mother. There's the communion of saints that surrounds us. There's something more than the endless filling and emptying of our life's water jar. You know, our bank account goes down, so we have to t work and top it up, and then it goes down again, and then it goes up again. It's the water jar, but there's something more. There's something different in us. There's someone different, the risen Christ. So, let us see what it's about, says Augustine. May we really see what it is about. That's the grace of Lent. And there is a postscript, huge postscript, really, but, and Samantha lived this too, that if the risen Christ is in us, has risen in us, then we can raise and carry one another just through our ordinary living and loving working, praying, through our suffering, through our hands and our looks and our words. The great mystery of Easter can burgeon everywhere. We can't stop the spring. You know, spring is going to happen. We may feel miserable, we may feel happy. It may rain some days, uh, it may not, but spring is going to happen. And the resurrection happens everywhere. Let us see what it is 